Hi, I'm Simon Buckingham Shum, and I'm from the University of Technology, Sydney, where I direct the Connected Intelligence Centre. Today we're going to be thinking about uh, an issue that's really affecting society at large, which is the increasing use of artificial intelligence and data science techniques to um, help people make decisions, or in some cases to make decisions all on their own. And this is uh, an issue, as we'll see, which is now provoking a lot of very healthy debate about learning analytics um, uh, within the education sector as well. We are not by any means immune from the questions of ethics and accountability around these kinds of technologies. So let's take a look at what this might mean for the education sector as it gets to grips with these kinds of new technologies. So here's an interesting tweet that um, uh, is one of my favorites. On the left, we have this beautiful, organic, living um, piece of uh, tree. Uh, it's not so living now, it's been chopped off, but it represents, as we can see when we translate the Dutch, it represents learning and knowing as it, ex you know, as it takes place in the real world. And then we have attempts to measure this phenomenon. And um, we can dissect the, the, the phenomenon and count different things. And lo and behold, we have a, a bar graph with some statistics. And the provocation, of course, is, um, well, have we lost something important in the process of trying to measure this thing? Now, this is a general issue with any kind of accounting, auditing, classification, or other system for, for quantifying uh, rich phenomena. Uh, today, we're going to be thinking particularly about whether uh, technology is, in some sense, um, biasing or uh, you know, distorting learning when we start using data science and AI technologies. I had to give a talk at an event once called Code Acts in Education. And um, I was asking Siri um, to find Kodaks in Education. I wanted it to find the website. And um, Siri helpfully searching the web for Code Accident Education. And um, that seemed to sum it up very nicely because I was going there to talk about exactly the issue today of uh, how technology can potentially, how analytics could distort the phenomena of learning. So Siri was astutely observing that we might, in the process of deploying different kinds of code, actually cause some damage to the very thing we care about. So um, Kate Crawford is a, a researcher at Microsoft and also affiliated with uh, uh, NYU and MIT. And she's been doing a lot of great thinking about um, how AI can be misused for uh, uh, inappropriate purposes. Let's take a look at this clip from her YouTube movie where she talks about the rise of algorithms. I just want to answer this one question from Slido because <laughs> it's a really good one. Um, what is your view on algorithms that are profiling international travelers, including special screening at airports? <laughs> well, this is near and dear to my heart um, as somebody who gets profiled at airports. So, you might have heard that a documentary maker here at South By just, just flew in two days ago, was stopped um, at the airport. Uh, he is an American citizen. He hadn't been to particularly any countries that would have set off a red flag um, and was taken to secondary and was asked a lot of really difficult questions. Um, and he wrote about this uh, just you know, in Twitter saying, you know, this is this has really changed for me. I've never had these sorts of problems before. And the officer at um, sort of Customs Border Patrol said to him, oh, look, mate, it's just the algorithms, mate. I don't know, like maybe you've just, you just look like one of those guys. <laughs> and, and I thought it was a really interesting response because at a certain point, they don't know why you've been flagged. It's just the algorithms, right? So trying again to think about when these systems distance us from difficult spaces of accountability, and let's be clear, the border is a difficult space, that's something that I think we have to track very closely. And certainly, borders and liminal areas are where you start to see power really exerting itself. So I would say keep a close eye on what's happening on the US border, because it will tell us a lot about what's coming down the pipeline. 
And the question of how data science and AI is impacting society at large is becoming one of increasing importance and, and, and visibility. So there are some great books out now, such as Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill and Frank Pasquale's The Black Box Society, which bring the issues that I'm going to be flagging for you today to a general audience. Um, they touch on education, at least Cathy, Cathy does, briefly, but of course we'll be doing a deep dive into education around these issues. And um, very encouragingly, um, the Obama administration were very, very engaged with some of these questions around you know, the promises and the pitfalls of deploying big data in society and how that might even damage rather than promote civil rights. And you can follow those links up later. Okay, so let's do a thought experiment to just think about what, how might this kind of issue play out in, 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 in a learning analytics context. Okay, well, here's an example. Um, let's imagine we have an early warning system that is flagging for the academic that student A at the top there is on red. Um, this student has, uh, for whatever reason, not been doing very well for the last three weeks, say. However, um, the story is rather complicated because the student logs in and every time she logs in, the LMS is flagging that she's on red, which means she's at risk of some sort if she doesn't pull her socks up and uh, knuckle down. However, um, you know, life is complicated. Um, she's already informed the student services about her disability and she's had a recent bereavement. She's working with her tutor to, to figure out a catch-up plan. But the system isn't aware of all this. Uh, the university systems perhaps aren't joined up enough. Um, and it simply knows that she's falling behind and is helpfully telling her this every time she logs in. So we might imagine that we've got a, a bit of an ethical issue here. However, the, the university might respond, don't worry, it's nothing personal, it's just the algorithm. And um, in one sense, that's uh, a reasonable response, but I hope you'd agree that in another sense, that's really not an adequate response. We'll be thinking about in what senses that is not an adequate response and, and, and why. Okay, here's another example um, from a fictional social network analysis. And we have a student here who is clearly not very well connected into the, uh, the community of learners, according to the system. However, the student, aware that the social network analysis is being used in the course, doesn't feel happy about being visualized like this. You know, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, you know, I chat with peers all the time in the cafes. Um, now, the university might say, ah, don't worry, it's nothing personal, it's just the algorithm. And uh, the student might be reassured by that, but again, we've got another example here of how um, an analytic system is now making visible something that used to be invisible, and the visualization has got some ethical dimensions to it. Um, uh, the student might be worried that this changes the academic's perception of them. Um, the student says that they're engaged with their peers, but according to the system, they're not, simply because um, it's not tracking the student all the time, which we might also consider to be reassuring. On the other hand, quite a few people are quite interested in the idea that we can now track students all around campus and, uh, and follow them into the cafes in fact, um, there is uh, one experiment I'm aware of at the moment, which is looking at whether peers, uh, students um, buy the university sweatshirt as a, an indicator of how much sense of a belonging they have within the university. So we could have a, a good old debate about surveillance and privacy, of course, um, and that will come up later on. Um, but the point for this example is that we've got an ethical dimension to a visualization here. Uh, and the student, being aware that they're being tracked like this, um, is, is unhappy about that. Okay, so the question then is, what would it mean for our systems to be accountable? Accountable to whom? Um, uh, and for what purposes? What kinds of questions might they be asking? And um, we can learn from some of the debate that's going on right now around algorithms and artificial intelligence in society at large 
to inform our thinking about how this might play out within the educational sector. So for example, there is a fantastic resource at the Governing Algorithms conference site where they are talking uh, in great detail about, about these sort of social justice issues. And um, they ask, you know, what do we mean when we talk about governing algorithms? It's a great, a great title, of course, because is it about us governing algorithms or algorithms governing us? Who's in control? I mentioned Frank Pascali's work. Um, I put a link in here to a, a talk he gave at the, the, the London School of Economics. Again, talking about how algorithms are increasingly making decisions about, for example, who's going to get credit or not, and um, many other aspects of our life. So hash algorithmic accountability is becoming uh, a bit of a thing, uh, and you'll be able to find resources on, on that uh, Twitter handle. And by the, by the, the, the sort of the concept of algorithms and accountability, I think they mean perhaps two different things. One is, first of all, that algorithms make you and me more accountable. They are quantifying aspects of our lives. Um, and they can track us, you know, in, in a great fidelity. Uh, and they can do work in some senses that humans don't like to do or can't, in fact, do as consistently um, uh, and as efficiently as, 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 as a machine can do. But the other sense that we're really interested in, of course, is also about making those algorithms that make you accountable, accountable themselves. And what would that mean? So. Uh, many people have said, well, we, we need to be able to open this black box and um, see what's inside. We can't just be trusting these systems as opaque things that take data in and spit out some action or some result and without knowing what's going on inside. And many disciplines have a perspective on, on this, this uh, thorny question, which makes it a very intellectually stimulating area now. If you look at all the different perspectives that you can imagine um, these people bringing to the question of uh, how to make something accountable and how technology has evolved and been held to account in, in the past. Okay, well, let's have a look in the black box then. Um, unfortunately, it turns out to be quite a complicated matter. Well, first of all, let's think about what are, what are algorithms. Um, Paul Durish has given a very helpful uh, lecture, uh, uh, which I would encourage you to take a look at. Well, um, at their simplest, you know, we can imagine algorithms as being rules, rules for transforming data into some kind of output. But a set of rules written down on a, on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper, um, that's not going to change the world. Rules have got to be implemented in code which have then got to operate on some kind of data. Um, and of course, that requires material platforms, hardware, software as well. And um, life is made more difficult now because those uh, servers may be running all over the world in some kind of distributed architecture. So tracking exactly what happened when um, a system produced a particular result is now quite a complicated matter in some cases. Now, it may be that at the moment, um, in the world of education, our systems have not reached the kind of scale that we see out there in, in wider society. Um, but inevitably, as we move to the cloud, as uh, services are owned by companies um, and not necessarily run purely internally by universities, um, these kinds of challenges are going to come up should a system be called to account. Now, why are they black boxes? Why are they not glass boxes? Well, um, because, um, as Borrell has helpfully um, set out, um, I've got my intellectual property. I'm not going to tell you how my cool technology works. That's my secret source. And if we simply demand that all learning analytics are open source and fully transparent, we are also in the process, perhaps, um, stifling the innovation economy and all those uh, creative startups who might have a new approach to making sense of data. So it's an interesting question about how we handle 
intellectual property that says, well, I can't disclose how my black box works, but if you're happy with how it performs, then that should be enough for you. There's an issue of, of literacy, you know. Um, if an educator asks how something works, showing them the source code or the machine learning algorithms isn't going to be terribly helpful. Ditto for a student. So we always have to ask the question, well, what does it mean to explain how the algorithm is working? To whom? And with what level of literacy would it, do they bring? And what would count as a satisfactory answer? OK, so a professor of machine learning would expect a very different kind of answer than um, an academic who simply is considering using this technology to improve their, their teaching. And finally, we have the complexity of the infrastructure, as already noted, that um, it can just be really hard to, uh, to answer some of these questions. So algorithms may not be found in, in, in the, a black box in, in a very simple manner. Um, Paul Durish talks about algorithms um, as, you know, these are abstractions that computer scientists and mathematicians um, work with. Um, it may be not possible to reverse engineer those um, out of a running system. Um, and one approach to understanding these would be to, to study them, uh, to, to, to uh, use eth ethnography and other, other ways of studying what goes on in, in the workplace to, to track how an algorithm is, is given birth to. And you know, we might ask, Durish um, suggests, you know, to, to ask, well, what was the original intent for the development of this algorithm? Who sanctioned their implementation? And so forth. OK, now let's think about learning analytics. And I want to suggest that um, we can take some lessons from current thinking about algorithms in society at large and focus not just on the, uh, the algorithms, uh, not just on the rules, and not just on the code that implements them, but on the whole system. The whole system that is the people as well as the code, as well as the way that they work and the way that they use the learning analytics tool. That is the whole system. It's a rich, complex, socio-technical system. And we need to ask, how is that acting in the world? And it's perhaps less about accountability and more about designing systems with integrity. So let's pan back a little bit and think about the whole system and think about learning analytics system integrity. One person who's been thinking about a very similar concept is Anani, um, who has written a very useful paper, which I've put down at the bottom of the slide there. And he talks about algorithmic assemblages. And um, just to give you the, the high-level view, he suggests that algorithms perform a number of functions, um, which we can see along the top here. They are uh, using uh, techniques to infer associations between uh, people or uh, uh, between uh, phenomena in the world. Algorithms are performing this very important function of classification, which is you know, drawing boundaries between things. Um, and finally, algorithms are also suggesting that there are windows of opportunity to act in some way based on the, the sense that they're making of the world. And he also talks about the fact that we are, of course, dealing with code, but importantly, we're dealing with work practices, which are the ways of you know, teaching that we are using uh, in the university, for example. And there are cultural norms that need to be taken into account, and, and uh, uh, particular ways of thinking and particular values in the system. So when we take these all together, then he suggests what we might be doing is saying, OK, in what sense is the algorithm uh, classifying something uh, or inferring an association 
between two phenomena? And how does that intersect with one or more of work practices or cultural norms? So you might find that a useful framework to think about in relation to your own work. And we'll look at some other, another framework now, which is perhaps something you could bring to bear when you think about the systems that you're involved with. So exactly what is the algorithmic assemblage, if we're going to use Anani's term, what is the system that's involved in creating a learning analytics application? Well, first of all, within, <clears throat> within the field, um, we have educational theories, uh, as well as instructional frameworks. Uh, and many learning analytics systems are either based on those or are trying to support them in some way. Then we have people who are actually working in learning analytics themselves, researchers as well as uh, um, analysts of different sorts, who are trying to build a system that's going to make sense of the world automatically in some way. As we've noted, that then is going to have to be implemented. Uh, so we have programmers. They're working with hardware and software. They're looking at sensing data of different sorts. And they are using user interfaces of some sort to communicate to a user of some sort. That user might be a learner, um, because we actually want to create a feedback loop that changes the learner's behavior in some sense. Uh, it might well be an educator, and of course many analytic systems at the moment are designed only for educators in order to help them track the progress of the students. Floating around somewhere, one hopes there may be some ethical principles that are um, shaping the, the way the system has been designed or is going to be deployed, the kinds of data it's going to collect, and so forth. But an important point that I want to make is that um, ethics is not just a set of abstract principles or guidelines. Um, ethics are actually sort of pervading uh, this whole system that I'm showing you. Okay, now there's a bunch of different relationships that we uh, could be looking at. And what I'm going to do is step through these different relationships in slow motion as we look at how a system actually has, uh, only, is only possible when these are all joined up. And if we were going to hold the system to account, we might be examining how well these different connections have been implemented in the whole system. OK, let's start by thinking about all the different disciplines that we have in learning analytics. And the field is so exciting because we bring together people who come from very different backgrounds and think about the world in, in rather different ways. And because I come from uh, an approach to thinking about computer systems that's known as human-centered informatics, where informatics is looking at information systems which are both comprising humans and machines, and we're trying to do that in a human-centered way. And I would like to think that um, this would embrace a whole range of different perspectives within learning analytics. So first of all, we have people who are coming from a, um, a background of ethics, and particularly thinking about how technology uh, is influenced or changes how we think about ethics. That's a well-established field with its own journal and, and conferences, etc. Obviously, we have computer scientists. Um, and more recently, we have this new thing called data science, which is specifically looking at the the ways in which machines can sense and reason about uh, data, derived from certain forms of AI, especially machine learning, and also from statistics. Um, a number of people are thinking about human data interaction, specifically, as data becomes this pervasive um, thing that we have to deal with in our lives. Uh, many of you will be familiar with user-centered design, which seeks to uh, ensure that systems are designed with users involved in the, the whole process, uh, not just at the end. And um, very important, of course, this is about education. So we would expect the learning sciences as well as the measurement sciences to be involved, the people who study how you design good assessment and how you can claim to have implemented something that assesses a quality that's invisible um, in, the, in the user's head. Um, but has to be made visible in some form through designing a well-designed activity and assessment. 
And uh, somewhere along the line, it's possible that all of these might be used if it ever came to uh, a legal challenge around a learning analytics system. On what basis would a lawyer attack or defend a learning analytics system as having integrity, as being ethically designed, um, as being accountable? And my suggestion is that the insights that these different perspectives bring should be the sorts of things we would hope that a well-informed legal defense or legal attack might draw on. Okay, so let's think about the kinds of questions that the ethics of technology would bring to a learning analytics system. And broadly, they would bring uh, one of three different kinds of critique, which Anani has summarized in that article. Um, the deontological critique says, okay, to what extent is this system compliant with current um, policies, for example, a privacy policy or a data protection policy? Uh, to what extent does this system uh, make use of people who you know, um, uh, perform duties and conduct work in ways that we already recognize? Or to what extent does this system produce results that are align with how we already think about the world? So for example, if the system decides that a particular student is at risk, maybe there is other evidence in the world that suggests that they are indeed at risk. And so we would say that the system has you know, produced something that we validate. If the system analyzes a piece of student writing and concludes that it's a fail, is that correspond, does that align with how an expert um, educator assesses that writing? Or is it drawing a different conclusion? So that would be the deontological mindset. However, interestingly, um, systems are, are being developed now that um, are coming out with different kinds of consequences from how we classify the world. And this is known as thinking about it teleologically. So regardless of whether there are any policies that could have governed the system or whether there are any existing pieces of data about the world that we can compare the systems to, if the system is coming out with new kinds of results and having new kinds of consequences, do we consider those to be good things? So for example, we may never have been able to predict a student's uh, risk of failure at the level of precision and at the level of timeliness that we can now. Uh, we might never have been able to give students instant feedback on their competency until now. Is that a good thing? Is it good that they can get feedback 24-7? So a, dis a disruptive technology um, forces us to ask new kinds of questions about whether we think it's, it's a good thing, right? Finally, um, a different kind of third, a third, sort of third perspective is to look at the values that um, the design team brought. So they might have stated very explicitly that they want to try and promote a certain kind of learning activity, or they want to try and improve the outcomes for particular minority groups. Um, so it's a very values-driven kind of design and um, the question then is, well, what exactly were those values? And also, when end users come to that system, is that how they see the system design? Um, I put in brackets there a note that those of you who are familiar with the human computer interaction literature may be familiar with the, the work on claims analysis by Jack Carroll and Mary Beth Rossum. And they talk there about the idea that that uh, a system is making implicit claims about the world by the way it's designed its data, the way that it, the user interface is designed. It's essentially saying users are interested in this kind of thing. This kind of information is important. That kind of information is not important. Therefore, we haven't got it on the home screen. These are the navigational paths the user wants to take. Therefore, um, that's why we support that kind of activity. And those claims can be critiqued, of course, and, and challenged. So those are three pers perspectives. And Anani also makes the, the interesting point that deontological and teleological critiques 
may be difficult to apply in a very fast-moving emerging field because there may be no existing frameworks that can be used to govern their, their design and deployment. Um, <clears throat> and if we think about asking, well, is the, um, is, are the consequences of the system for, for users desirable or poor? Well, if every user is getting a bespoke personalized experience, as you do from some of these systems, um, then um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a more complicated question to ask. OK, let's think about computer science now. Um, and not surprisingly, computer scientists are obviously particularly interested in um, the, the kinds of questions about the relationship between an algorithm, the, the, the fidelity of the algorithm, and also the question about how well it was implemented, how efficiently it was implemented, whether it does in the code what it was supposed to do when it was written on the whiteboard. Okay, so the, uh, you know, if we think about that, um, the response that, uh, well, it's just the algorithm, it's uh, from the example given before, the system was behaving as it was intended to behave at one level. You know, the, uh, the uh, social network algorithm had been correctly implemented in the, in the system, and the visualization was displaying things as had been intended. However, um, as you can see, the, the relationship between uh, the, the, the user interface, the software, and the algorithm is only part of the whole system that we can now see here. So it's an adequate response at one level, but it's clearly an inadequate response in terms of the whole system's influence and impact on the, on the student. So the computer scientists might ask, well, does the running code actually operationally, uh, operationalize the algorithm correctly? Uh, they might be interested in whether you can reverse engineer the algorithm from the system's behavior. Um, a computer scientist will often ask, where's the source code? It's only when I see the source code that I can truly understand how this thing is working. Um, similarly, if um, uh, the source code is very badly written, the idea that it's transparent and clear is more questionable because another developer may really struggle to understand what's going on. And um, we might also ask, you know, well, can we understand why the system is generating this behavior under different conditions? And this is a particularly important question when it comes to the, some of the approaches like deep learning, um, where a neural network can be very hard, if not impossible, to understand. Um, so the, the kind of underlying representation that's being used, whether it's rule-based or more connectionist, that, that can severely uh, you know, impact the transparency of what's going on in the system. OK, moving on to <clears throat> data science. Um, particularly interested in, in the, the relationship between the code and the software, but also um, we're going to be very interested in the relationship between, for example, training data and uh, the system's performance and the algorithm and the, and the, the model that's being developed about uh, how, the, how the world works and um, what, what should be considered true and false. So data scientists would ask questions such as, what's the integrity of the data here? You know, um, have you embodied some bias in your training set? We'll come back to that in a moment because training data is a picture of the past. And as we know, in the past we've made a lot of mistakes about how we uh, classify things in terms of student demographics, uh, different minority groups, etc. So if the data that you've trained a machine on is distorted in some significant way, then you've simply built a model that replicates um, uh, historic biases of some sort. We might ask questions about uh, the integrity of the features that are being selected, the, the features that you want to predict, the features that you want to pay attention to. <clears throat> do they do justice to the complexity of the phenomenon that we're talking about? Another question we might ask is about uh, proxies. Uh, if you can't get at the data that you would really like to get at, have you chosen a proxy that um, is, is a legitimate one? Or could it, in fact, embody bias of some sort? So we might say, well, we can't get at um, exactly what the students are doing at that point. But we know that students who do that kind of thing also tend to do this. 
well, if students, that may or may not be a legitimate move to make. And um, I'm referring you to the, an article there by Barakas and Selps, who have um, you know, partnered to think about this uh, from a combined machine learning and legal perspective. Uh, addressing concerns, uh, particularly in the US, which is their context, around whether um, big data could in fact um, impede rather than advance civil rights. This is an example of uh, algorithmic decision making, which um, uh, would impact all of you, I would imagine. Uh, increasingly, you have to get past an algorithm to get a job in certain kinds of organizations. They have thousands of applications coming in, and the resumes will be shortlisted based on um, machine uh, analysis of the resumes. Uh, so there's quite a lot of concern about exactly how these decisions are being made. A version of this I proposed in, in a talk several years ago now, um, which presented the following fictional scenario, but perhaps increasingly less fictional. So we have uh, somebody trying to decide whether to accept a student onto a course, and the system is flagging that they've got a high-risk profile, and you can see all the reasons why the system has reached this conclusion, and they may all be quite legitimate. Uh, the system, moreover, is recommending that you know, um, a, a particular uh, advanced tutor is going to be needed if this student is going to be supported adequately, and that's going to be expensive. So now, burdened with this rich knowledge, um, the, the decision has to be made as to whether to accept or reject a student. Well, you might consider that to be a, a nightmare scenario of some sort, or you might consider it to be exactly the kind of intelligence that will help us make better evidence-based decisions. I'll leave you to ponder that one. But um, the worrying thing is that this, in fact, has already started to happen. And um, a well-documented case study uh, has been reported where um, a university trained uh, an algorithm to shortlist candidates for interview, and it performed to the point where it was doing it just as well as the humans. The humans agreed that it was doing the same, the same job and making the same decisions that they would have reached had they been reading all those resumes. Unfortunately, what they had done was built a machine and baked into it what turned out to be systematic institutional bias against uh, women and racial minorities. Uh, this is just you know, a nice example of how machines can embody biases because it's being trained on data from the past and that past was not a happy past, not one that we want to perpetuate. And Barakas has, you know, compellingly argued that, you know, it'd be very uh, a great mistake for policymakers to think of big data and algorithms as neutral and objective. On the contrary, you could be actually exacerbating the situation rather than improving it. The argument, of course, is that humans are biased and prejudiced and will reach decisions for all sorts of strange reasons which aren't made explicit. And if we deploy an algorithm, then we can iron out all of that um, inconsistency. Well, that may be true, but it might not be true. And so he talks about you know, the problems that this could raise. And it's a real heads up for those in government who are thinking about making efficiency measures by replacing people with machines. OK. Now let's think about um, uh, an area called human data interaction, and that's particularly interested in the um, relationship between citizens and data at, at large in society. Uh, it, it starts to think about the relationships that <clears throat> the individual might have to other friends and colleagues. It's also looking at the, the fact that data is coming from uh, many, many people these days. Um, and it's really hard to disentangle my data from other people's data as well. So um, work by Crabtree and Mortier, for example, asks a whole bunch of questions about um, accountable data transactions, for example. So 
uh, they're very interested in the idea that in the future we might be um, in more control, having more control over our personal data, and um, in which case there have to be clearer protocols for exactly how uh, the system might ask for, the da for data um, and how I give permission for that to be used and so forth. They talk a lot about um, the social data infrastructure. Um, so, for example, um, how, do you, how do you hold the uh, complex infrastructure which involves people and machines to account um, as, as, as more and more data is just captured automatically? The fact that if I wanted to give permission for my data to be used, but some of that data involves interactions with other people, increasingly, then um, do I also have to be able to get permission from all of those people before the data can be used? So our lives are tangled up with other people's lives increasingly. And um, a great concern about agency that we might also think about for our students, about to what extent they have control over who is accessing their data. Um, can they understand what's going to be done with it? And who's going to exactly use those results and for what purposes? And um, one of the exciting things about data science, of course, is that um, you can slice and dice the data in many ways. Um, in iterative cycles, as new ideas come up, you can examine the data in new, new ways. But what does it mean to, uh, <clears throat> to give informed consent as a, a student, for example, um, when uh, the analysts may want to do all sorts of interesting things and join it up with other data that they can't actually predict at the moment. And so there is a, a certain school of thought that is saying, well, we, re we really need to focus on the, the ethics of what somebody wants to do rather than trying to you know, give consent in advance to, uh, and require that you know, researchers in learning analytics, for example, uh, specify exactly what they want to do with the data, which then, of course, prevents them from doing other things. So that's a very live debate at the moment. User-centered design will be familiar to many of you and really asks about the, the involvement of the stakeholders in the design process. And user-centered design would be asking questions about, for example, well, who are the intended end users? Educators, students, students of a certain sort, um, decision makers about the viability of a course. Many different people have different perspectives. Um, given a particular kind of user, are they going to understand what they're looking at when your system generates its output? And is that actionable? Will they be able to take suitable courses of action or inappropriate courses of action? Um, there is some evidence emerging now, for example, that students of certain sorts may actually find um, you know, a visualization of their progress in relation to their cohort to be demotivating, quite the opposite of what we want to do with good formative feedback. So um, on the one hand, you might decide that you want to show the student how far behind they're falling, and that'll be you know, a spur to greater effort. On the other hand, you could simply crush their motivation and depress them further. Um, what is the intelligibility of the system? Who can ask questions about how it's behaving? Um, can you give feedback if you think the system's giving, got it wrong in some sense? Um, important questions. And the whole process by which that system came into being in the first place. Um, who got to say what the system should do, how it should appear, um, the ways that it should be used? And given that we are increasingly concerned about the engagement that academics will have with these technologies and the engagement that students will have with these tools, if they were to be involved early on in the process, in the early conception stages, in the storyboarding stages, um, then we are surely more likely to have their perspectives taken into account in the final design and they would have a sense of ownership of it, perhaps, if they'd actually been involved in, in developing the system. That's particularly, you know, that, that, that is possible if a, if a university is developing its own tools to involve their own students, of course. But it, it falls to software companies to involve their stakeholders, and especially students. It's in their own interests 
that students have actually told them this would be useful, this would not be useful. That's just plain creepy that you're tracking me like that. That will just backfire on a vendor product later on if they haven't involved the users earlier on. Finally, of course, this is all about learning. This is all about assessment of different sorts. Learning analytics systems can really be thought of as new instruments for different kinds of assessment. Whether that's summative assessment, which is giving a grade, or formative assessment, which is simply seeking to improve the feedback loops to help the, the learner or the educator adjust their behavior um, mid-flow. And so these are the kinds of relationships that we would be interested in. Um, <clears throat> uh, exactly uh, how is the learning theory that is being claimed to be used, for example, to inspire a learning analytics system being translated from what exists informally in text and in textbooks, journal papers, conference papers, the process of moving from there to a formal representation is not a straightforward one. Uh, to what extent can it be argued that the, uh, the inspiration for the system has been preserved and implemented with integrity? You know, it's an interesting question to ask whether the, the academic or educational practitioner who developed this is at all aware that their work is now existing in the world of software and algorithms. What would they think about that? Equally, of course, the system is designed to, in the end, produce certain kinds of learning outcomes. And we, we would be surprised if the learning outcomes that were being focused on in the learning analytics system were not coherently aligned with the learning theory that it claimed to be uh, inspired by. Or if the pedagogy and practices of the educators were not aligned coherently with the, the, the role of the educator within the learning theory. Uh, measurement science is the very well established discipline of um, designing assessments so that they have integrity, robustness, uh, and that people can have a level of confidence in them, that they are indeed assessing what they claim to assess. And so some of the questions that we would be expecting to ask about the accountability of this system, should it be challenged on these grounds, would be, does the algorithm implement the intended constructs with integrity? A very different question from, does the code implement the algorithm with integrity? That was the computer science question. Um, is it actually improving learning? Obviously a very important question. And in many cases, um, are educators benefiting from using the system in some way? And there's the assessment at the integrity uh, question. Of course, each of these points are huge research and practitioner fields in their own right. So I'm hardly doing justice to the complexity that sits behind each of these. The point is to simply you know, group some example perspectives under this, under this heading. So does the assessment claim to be measuring uh, uh, the, con the constructs uh, robustly and what does that mean exactly? We can imagine a system being challenged that you claim to be assessing me on this and in fact you've reached the wrong conclusion. That's an assessment integrity question. Okay, I'm going to step through a couple of examples now, very quickly, um, but there are references for you to follow up these in more detail if you want to. So let's just imagine that we are going to bring to bear these lenses as we walk around a particular learning analytics system. You can think of these lenses as sort of doing a 360 degree assessment where we look at this object from very different angles in order to see different nooks and crannies and strengths and weaknesses. So the first work we're going to talk about is the idea that we could give automated feedback on writing, reflective writing in particular. So this is a screenshot from the system just to give you an example of what we're talking about. And um, the um, system is highlighting certain kinds of sentences 
Uh, for example, this green sentence has been flagged as a sort of summary signal signaling sentence. The student has indicated to the reader what this paper that they are writing is intending to accomplish. Down here, we have the system flagging that it's picked up some kind of disagreement, tension, options, or consistency. Okay, uh, and the student has argued that uh, something failed to appreciate something else. Okay, it's a limitation of some sort. There's a problem that they're flagging in their writing. Here are some other examples. Um, they, the system is flagging that they are um, using emphasis, uh, that something was a plainly wrong test, or that we've got unknown knowledge of some sort, we've created uncertainties, or that there's something that we don't know. We're, we have a limitation to our knowledge of some sort. Okay, so this is the feedback the student can get 24-7 on their draft writing. It's formative feedback, we're not grading the work, but it's designed to show them where their writing has the hallmarks of good academic, analytical, critical writing. Okay, so now we're going to do our 360 assessment on this, and um, very quickly we can imagine mounting a critique from a, an ethics of technology perspective. Okay, so we have here the deontological critique. Is the system actually matching the kinds of things that a human would say? That would be an example of uh, a deontological critique. Um, we might say, well, now that we can provide instant feedback 24-7, is that actually a good thing? Or does it actually disrupt the students from developing the kinds of writing competency we want them to? Uh, the, the virtues critique, well, that was the third category of ethics critique. We'd be looking at the motivation behind this, which we might get from research papers. Um, it's a focus on reflection. Reflective writing uh, is very different from a more analytical uh, kind of writing. Uh, why? Why is reflection important? Do we actually agree that um, that's something that, that, that should be valued? The computer science uh, perspective would, for example, ask, you know, well, you wanted to pick up certain features and moves in the writing. Does the platform actually manage to do that? And exactly how does it do that? A data science perspective might ask, well, you're particularly paying attention to certain features, but are they the right ones? Um, have you ignored something? Um, the fact that you're looking for certain kinds of reflection, is that biased against any particular kinds of students? Uh, a human data interaction perspective might say, you're asking students to have their writing analyzed. Um, were they aware that that was going to happen? Were they expecting this to happen? A user-centered design perspective would ask to what extent the stakeholders were involved in the creation of the system. It might also look, of course, at the usability of the system and whether students or academics felt that the output was suitably actionable. The learning technology, learning theory, learning sciences perspective uh, might be asking, well, what is the educational basis for the rules that you've written? Um, did the algorithm actually implement the rubrics or the theory with integrity? Um, what kinds of reactions do educators and students have to this? Um, and finally, we might ask whether the student could sue the university because uh, it told me that my writing was good, but in the end, I only got a bare pass. Or, this system is only good for people who are, whose language, first language is English. My language is, I'm struggling with my English, but that means I can't benefit from this kind of feedback because it doesn't work well enough on my poor English. Okay, so to be very critical about one of my own systems, these, these are the kinds of critiques that um, I might expect and which I need to have some good answers to. Here's a second example. It's picking up on the uh, social network visualization that we showed at the beginning. Um, here it is, uh, just to remind you, and it's aggregating data 
from multiple social media platforms in order to draw the connections between the members of the learning community, whether it was on Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, WordPress, and many other sites. Okay, so how would one think about this from these different perspectives? Well, a deontological critique would say, you're building a picture of how social, the social ties between the students, but are those social ties actually what um, we uh, actually correspond to what's going on in the world? Um, does the system lead to novel benefits would be one of those tele teleological questions. We've never been able to see this before. Now, for the first time, we can see how bonds are forming between students. But is that a good thing to see? Um, and what was the motivation behind the design of the system? You know, what values inspired the, the, the people who wanted to deploy the system? The computer scientists would be worrying in particular about whether we had actually implemented the metrics correctly that could identify which students seem to be particularly important in the community. Uh, a data scientist might be asking about whether the data set was biased or incomplete in some way, or whether the visualization um, biases for, uh, in, 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 in particular ways against certain kinds of students, uh, if we had an ethical hat on. From a human data interaction perspective, uh, what's the level of control that students have about their visibility when they are tracked and when they're not tracked? In what sense do they give consent for this to happen? Uh, does disclosing data about my peers um, actually give away too much information to a student? Um, who gets to see the whole network diagram? And do students see a different visualization from what the educator sees? Should you be able to identify people from the nodes? Or should they just be anonymized? so that um, we get a sense of the whole health of the community, but we can't zero in on individuals? Or indeed, is it possible to, dis to, to disguise that? And anybody who wanted to could probably figure out who a student was by looking at their network. The user-centered design perspective, of course, would be asking to what extent the stakeholders were part of the design of the system, and also whether the actual user interface and the visualization helped them or was simply, you know, curiosity but didn't really um, assist in the learning in any, in any meaningful way. The learning technology, learning sciences, measurement sciences perspective might ask questions like, well, why are you trying to make social ties visible? What's that got to do with learning? Um, do the selected user actions implement this with integrity? And did the students find it helpful? And um, lastly, well, in my fictional scenario at the beginning, the student felt very uncomfortable that they had been picked out as some kind of a loner, even though in their view that was not true. So we might be worried, it, perhaps, about the uses to which a visualization like this uh, might be put uh, and um, whether it was permanent or ephemeral, whether it got refreshed every week, um, and so forth. OK, so finally, uh, let's just think about some other ways in which we might design for learning analytic system integrity. I've unpacked a whole raft of different critical questions that could be brought to bear and hopefully good answers provided from these different perspectives. So let's just think about a few other ways in which we could be designing in ways that, that promote this. I've already talked about this a little bit before, but let's just make it a little bit more concrete. Um, we're very interested in how we can involve students in actually uh, co-designing systems, which they don't have the technical ability to, to implement in any detail, but which they can use to storyboard and talk about what's important to them in their learning experience. And the participatory design field has developed a whole range of lo-fi, high-touch storyboarding tools that, that, that allow non-technical people 
to help shape the design and make their voice heard. Here's a nice example from Milligan and Oliveira at the University of Melbourne. Um, how could you communicate the algorithm to educators and students? And what we have here looks a little bit like a, a grading rubric where we're making it very clear to the viewer that we are going to pay attention to certain kinds of um, uh, qualities um, and that there is a progression to be made from being at level one to level five. And this is exactly what we mean when we say you're at level three. This is the kind of data that we're going to be looking at. Okay, so in completely non-technical terms, we are explaining what the system is looking for and exactly uh, how that will be judged according to level one to five. And we might say, well, this is exactly uh, like communicating to a student the rubric for an assignment. We want to make it very clear what they're being assessed on, how they should think about um, making their, their work visible, how they should demonstrate their competency, and um, how that will be judged. Same could apply for a, a real live analytics system with some complex algorithms. And this is just a glimpse behind the scenes of some of Sandra Milligan's work, uh, which is a very nice example of how measurement science can be brought into dialogue with learning analytics, where we are looking at the top here on, for some particular capabilities. In this case, we're looking at what does it mean to be a very effective learner in a MOOC? And in their view, it involves these four qualities and I need to emphasize this is part of a much bigger diagram. And they then talk about the behavioral indicators that uh, they are going to use to decide, for example, that a student is um, developing a recursive focus. And you can see all the way down to the right-hand side that these are the actual um, phenomena in the log files of the, of the, of the MOOC platform that they're going to examine. So you might not want to put something like that in front of a student, um, but this is a more student-friendly view, for example. Another example I want to tell you about is what we call ethical design critique at UTS. And this is where we have a new system that's being proposed for deployment with some kind of analytics feedback. And the question is, <clears throat> is this ethical? That was the question that was presented to me. Is this satisfying ethical criteria? And the question then, of course, was, well, who gets to decide that? Um, and so one approach we did was to hold you know, um, uh, a workshop for half a day where we bring together all the key people from across the university who have a view about risk, protection, ethics, the law, uh, and so forth. And they engage in, in, a, in a, a very focused discussion, not about ethics and privacy principles in the abstract, but about a very particular set of proposed designs and the extent to which those designs satisfy the different concerns that these different people would bring. So here's an example. We're not going to go into this in any detail, but the point is here we're going to try and inform the, uh, the academic about the diversity of the students that they have got coming into their new class, whether it's gender or the kind of background they have and their ling linguistic uh, competence, the courses that they're coming in from, um, how enrollment has been going over the period in the build up to the start of the course in comparison to previous years, the particular route they're taking to get into higher education. Okay, And the question was, is it okay to show this kind of data? or are we inadvertently violating some privacy principles or any other principles? So we bring together these people and they are sitting in groups examining different aspects of the dashboard. They are encouraged to comment positively, of course, on whether, for example, the data seems to be at an appropriate level. That means that uh, you know, we're not disclosing inappropriate information about um, an individual. 
So the system, for example, does not permit you to drill down by applying one filter after another until you could identify an individual student. This is about cohort data. But of course, what we're particularly interested in is what the system might have done uh, better. So we, the, the team is being asked to, for example, talk about whether data is being shown, but it's incomplete data in some surprising way, or it's been filtered in some way. Uh, that might be misleading because you wouldn't expect the academic to know that it, that had been treated in that way. Or um, are we showing information that no one can really figure out why you would need to know this? There seems to be no apparent reasonable use for that data to be shown for the purposes for which this dashboard has been designed. Is there a poor visualization there that could actually be misinterpreted? So the team that we gather for this kind of design critique, they're not necessarily user interface or visualization design experts. But often, of course, they will look at something and be in the role as a proxy user. Um, some of them will be academics who would be end users of the system themselves. And so if they say, well, I really can't read that visual, or it seems to be suggesting this, when in fact it means that, you know, we've got a problem and a design expert needs to be brought in. Um, it might also be the case that it's very useful to present certain information, but um, it could be inappropriately used in some way, in which case we might want to be flagging that, cautioning it, wondering whether we need to give a particular kind of induction into the system in order to put some safeguards in place. So, to wrap up, I hope you found that a useful way of thinking about perhaps the own, the, own uh, the, the learning analytics systems that you're already involved in or thinking about designing. And I'm wondering whether what we might have here is a whole new career in the learning analytics field um, that will help us take the lid off the black box but also think about the much bigger system that is created and into which a learning analytics system is inserted. So perhaps we could imagine in the future the idea of a certified Lassie engineer. Learning analytics system integrity is something that requires multiple perspectives. It might be that you bring a team in or that the particular skill sets that you have in a learning analytics team already can be developed into an ethical critique kind of team as well. Multiple levels, different perspectives, all examining the kinds of assumptions and values that are being baked into your code and into the way in which it might be used. And we might also imagine that the kinds of questions and the kinds of answers that can be given to those questions create new principles that will guide design. Perhaps they'll guide the selection of vendors when they roll up to the university to pitch their product. Can they be held accountable against these kinds of criteria. That would raise the whole ethical bar for the vendors to satisfy. And in my view, that would be a good thing. And within the research field as well, can we imagine that peer review is also now going to start paying explicit attention to these kinds of concerns? And should there ever need to be a legal defense or a preemptive legal reflection on whether a system is vulnerable to a uh, legal challenge. Again, the kinds of questions and the different ways of answering those questions that I've been talking about would be the kinds of things we'd hope that an informed legal debate would be attending to. So I hope you found that useful. And um, I very much look forward to hearing as to whether some of these frameworks have helped you develop new insights into your learning analytics system integrity. Thanks very much.